So hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to today's webinar on navigating sustainable packaging materials and adaptable VFFS machines. My name is Emily Brogan. I am the marketing and sales coordinator for Rovima North America. And with me today, I have Kelly Eastman, our vice president of engineering. And then also with us today is a, a new face. We have a special guest, Simon Hermans. He is the sales and marketing director for Sudpacks division here in the U.S. So Simon, on behalf of Rovima, thanks for joining us today uh, on this discussion. Thank you for having me. So for everyone that's tuned in live, there's a poll option that I just deployed. And we're curious, when you think of your supply chain holistically, what phase of your business needs work from a resource usage perspective? Um, and I'll give you some examples. So the first one is freight. And so maybe because of the weight limits of your packaging, you think you can see it as it, that being an aspect that's holding you back from being able to ship more product. The second one is materials. So maybe you're using pre-made packaging or a heavier packaging like, like rigid packaging and you're sacrificing floor space or even high expenses of shipping those packages into your plant. Um, and then the third one is machine efficiency and uptime. So maybe you have a high cost of labor if, you, if you're maybe not where you could be for automation or you're expecting unexper or unplanned downtime that's really causing product and potential material loss. So, and then that last one really is consumer expectations. So an example of that would mean that you perhaps feel pigeonholed by the expectations of your customers to stay in a certain package type or material when you think that exploring a different uh, package type or material would, I mean, potentially change your business. So while you fill that out, I do have a couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording today's discussion and we'll share the recording with everyone tomorrow. And then you'll receive a follow-up email this time tomorrow, which will include the link to the recording and our slide deck that we're using today. Please use the Q&A function to submit any questions. And then at the end, we're gonna get through as many as we can. And if we don't get to your question, we are gonna email you a response. So to quickly lay some groundwork, um, you know, just so that we're all really speaking the same language, there are a lot of terms that are used within the sustainable packaging space. Simon, could you take us through these common terms and what they really mean? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think it's very important that we start with the lingo and the, lingo and the definitions first before we jump into, into the next 45 minutes. Um, starting right off, I think there's a there's a couple of really important factors that distinguish um, those, those terms, right? Um, Recyclable basically means that today you have materials available um, in, in rigid and flexible packaging that can be recycled and can be reused, repurposed again. Um, very important for the ones that are joining us today in the consumer brands, uh, consumer goods industry, as well as in the food industry. Recycling today means that in 99% uh, of the cases, this is downcycled, repurposed into something that cannot be reused again in, in food packaging or consumer goods packaging, meaning we'll make another park bench out of a cheese packaging or we make a water hose out of another um, chips bag. Um, biodegradable by itself can be distinguished into the overall biodegradable um, word, which then has a, a subsidiary being uh, compostable. Um, biodegradable basically means that you decompose the material by uh, living organisms uh, meaning and including specified temperatures and times and humidities to degrade that material into a different status. Uh, whereas composting really means that you're actually getting organic material out of that, uh, that resin at the end of the day. Um, that means that there is materials that, uh, um, how do I say that? Compostable is always biodegradable, but biodegradable is not always compostable, if that makes sense, right? Okay. Well, you know, often the market thinks of paper films as like the cleanest and greenest option. Yeah. And that really ties into the next question that we have of what advances in new materials and polymers are out there that folks can explore? Right. Um, I think if I 
there's so much to explore right now in this industry. If I look at uh, the activities that Suitpack has launched, is launching, will launch in the future, we've basically tied it into four quadrants. The first one talking about down gauging. So we're exploring with current materials, current polymers, how can we substitute um, and also reduce the amount of materials being used. If we're then looking more into the next quadrant, talking about renewable raw materials, this is where it gets really interesting because we're exploring developments uh, using um, plant-based resins that can substitute certain, um, set, certain other fossil fuel-based um, resins, uh, meaning that we're using plant-based material um, like cornstarch or sugarcane to actually replace certain parts of those films or actually replace the whole structure with a renewable resource uh, made material. The third one being where we talk about recyclable. There's some, some great developments also for the North American market, um, which some of you may know is very different to some other geographies when it comes to legislation and the requirements for recyclability and the claims that we can make today in this industry. Um, there, um, there are some, some, some great options available for, for, for North America on mono materials like polypropylene, where we see quite a few inroads being made right now by the whole industry and a lot of interest from, from our customer base. Um, same goes for monopolyester or monopolyethylene uh, uh, solutions. Um, there's some, some really interesting developments happening there. And then, of course, the, the fourth quadrant being probably the game changer for the future, where we actually talk about a circular economy where we're actually trying to remember what I just said before about recycling, where we're downcycling actually with a circular economy, we would truly repurpose that packaging material for the same purpose in the future. Again, um, there is uh, right now technologies where, where Suitpack is investing in and, and spending a lot of time, effort and, and resources on to launch commercial products that are uh, made of chemically recycled materials meaning that through the process of pyrolysis, uh, chemical recycling, you're actually obtaining virgin material out of post-consumer recycled product again. So you're repurposing, if you think of it and, you're, and you use your imagination in that webinar right now for a second with me, you're taking that bag of chips and it goes into a waste bin, it gets collected, then it gets actually recycled. At the end, it becomes resin again it gets shipped to suit pack. We make a film out of it again. And you as a customer can actually use that material again and use it as a potato bag or a chip bag again in the future. So some, some really, really exciting um, developments happening in, in all four quadrants, I'd say. That is exciting. Well, it, you know, it, it goes without saying though that one of the most important questions of sustainability is, you know, ultimately protecting the product. Um, we will go into the carbon footprint here in a second, but if folks take the time to invest in great material, but then it ultimately ends up in a landfill full of spoiled product, then we're nullifying any sort of sustainable packaging benefits. Um, and it's, it's really a shame. Um, Simon, diving deeper into that last point of, you know, new packaging materials and you're going to dive into all of the advancements and how rapidly the advancements have been happening over the last 24 months. Um, yep. What advances in barrier properties and strengths are happening right now in the film industry? Yeah. So I think the the really, the, the, and that is a very good question because at the end of the day, what, what we, what we cannot, what we cannot do is really to develop a product that doesn't meet certain barrier requirements. Let's take the protein industry again for an example. It's, it's all uh, nice that the, the industry wants to move into more paper-based products, but with a sheer paper-based wrapper today, I cannot just go and wrap a block of cheese or um, uh, uh, make, a, make a bag for shredded cheese out of it, for instance, because it would just uh, go bad very, very soon thereafter, which again would not really um, fit the purpose of today's supply chain challenges that we have. And at the end, we, we, we haven't achieved anything because we're, 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 we're just creating food waste, right? And I think we're touching on that later down, down the road today. But um, with the, so the biggest goal that we have, and, and this is where we are developing in, is that with all those quadrants that I mentioned before, 
we enable our customers on those applications to obtain similar or even better barrier properties in the future. That means some of them are currently available, some are in development, but it means that we are, that we are really understanding that we cannot really start to fiddle with the barrier requirements. We have to do the surroundings, the sealants, the, 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 the base layers of the films. And, and keep and ensure that we have those, uh, those barriers still intact for, for those products. Because at the end of the day, this is, uh, food waste is one of the biggest problems and our packaging is supposed to protect not only the product, but also the environment. So this is where we then need to make sure that we enable this barrier to be on the similar or even better level in the future. For sure. And, you know, you mentioned the, the meat and dairy industries and, I know that second to fresh produce, the amount of food storage or food spoilage in these categories is wicked high um, percentage wise, especially in the United States. And I think that, you know, that topic in itself is probably its own webinar. Um, so thanks, Simon. Before we dive into how all these innovations relate to packaging machinery, um, I do want to talk about the, the carbon footprint of the full material life cycle. You know, sourcing materials, manufacturing, packaging, case packing, storage of your finished product, and then transporting the finished goods, end of life processing, all of that, like the recycling that we're talking about. Simon, I took a look at the sustainability report on y'all's website, and it says that the most environmentally unfriendly thing to do would be to allow foodstuffs to perish by not protecting it. Um, and really, again, that just dives into the fact that if you can invest in films that fall into a sustainable category, it can't be recycled if it's full of product. Um, and I do want to show a quick or a quick carbon footprint breakdown. And this is for a wrapped hothouse cucumber. And we're probably all pretty familiar with seeing this in the market. Um, often, if you can use packaging to extend the shelf life or freshness of any sort of perishable product to the point where you can get even as little as a 3% increase in the amount of product that's getting consumed instead of thrown out, it'll result in a lower carb, a lower net carbon footprint for all of your items. So, and we won't be able to stay on this slide for long. Everybody will get this slide deck in case I don't give y'all enough time, but I, did, I do want y'all to digest these numbers because it, it's really fascinating. So Kelly, in your experience, and you're in the hot seat now, um, transitioning back to sustainable packaging, what operational considerations will folks need to keep in mind when evaluating any sort of renewable or sustainable packaging. Yeah, thanks, Emily. The, uh, uh, the considerations really uh, are not different for sustainable materials as they are for any materials. And we know there's a lot of, uh, uh, you're probably all familiar with uh, existing non-sustainable materials that do a good job with, the, uh, with packaging our products today. We're looking for the same sort of features the and for the from the perspective of the packaging machine uh, for vertical form fill seal so you might start with the static considerations for example so does are we able to include uh, anti-static additives in, in the new film or do we need to address that with the machine um, it's a fairly simple one it gets a little it can get into more complicated issues like uh, the uh, elasticity or flexibility of the material um, this is really important when, it, when we're moving the film over the forming column to make two. We want the film to be uh, rigid, elastic enough for, so it doesn't, we don't want it to tear going over the film. That's a problem with paper films for, for or paper products, as an example. Uh, tearing can be an issue, but uh, we want it to also not stretch. So there's, you want it to move over the forming collar, you want it to move down the forming tube. Um, so we want to be able to pull the film. So you want a high coefficient of friction on the outside of the film and a low coefficient of friction on the inside of the film to uh, allow it to move over the forming tube and be pulled by the uh, pull belts. Uh, and then you get into sealing concerns. Uh, and that's probably the biggest challenge with some uh, new products 
is you're looking for a, a good way to seal the material. Uh, you want to, especially so if you use the example of liquid products, the seal is really critical. You cannot have a leaking package. Um, but always you want to be able to protect the package. So you want to get a good quality seal and we need to be able to address that with the, with the new structures. Well, and Kelly, you sent me this graphic that really just shows the sealing solution that Ravima offers. Can you walk us through this really quickly? Yeah, sure. There's a, like I say, there's a couple of uh, things that we do on, uh, on the Ravima packaging equipment, for example, uh, to address, it gives you more flexibility in new films. So if you're looking at new, uh, right, this and premium cell is a great example of uh, one way to give yourself more flexibility in the types of materials you can run on, on a machine. So the premium sale process is really about giving, is about the control of the pressure uh, of the uh, jaws as they're making the horizontal seal on the film. So as the jaws come together, uh, as you walk here from the left to the right in this graphic, uh, you can see that when the jaws initially come together, we can keep a really light pressure because it's all servo controlled. There's no mechanical adjustment needed or anything, so it's, a, it's all programmable and settable from the HMI that uh, we can keep a light pressure uh, on the seal to maybe preheat, uh, say, a polyethylene the, the material that uh, give it a little, build a little heat energy into the uh, film before we squeeze, so you don't squeeze out the uh, adhesive layer. And then you can bring the jaws together at full force to get the final seal. And then you can even open uh, and to relieve the pressure and allow it to cool uh, before you open the, before you fully open the jaws. So that gives you a, a great sense of control over the, over the machine, through the machine to allow a great flexibility in the uh, types of products that can, the types of materials that can be run. And the, uh, uh, another factor that we use, we do use a D motion, which we don't have a graphic for, I don't think today, but uh, you can imagine two uh, capital Ds back to back so the uh, is the motion of our jaws and that uh, so you get the long side of the D it gives you a, the longest amount of time available it gives you a flexibility it gives you more time if you need more time to seal it really maximizes the seal time that we have available so there are a few things you can do in uh, technology to help give yourself flexibility on materials that sounds like a lot of things that have to happen at once. How fast are we talking when we talk about all of those stages of that have to happen for each package? Yeah, well, that's very dependent on the on the product and the package, and the, of course, the, but we can we run you know certainly easily speed you know, over 100, and uh, uh, even I think uh, some of our fastest machines run at uh, 250. I think packages and minimums are fastest ceiling. Um, all of this is the the good. The advantage through the Rovima equipment is that uh, all of that is really done in the background. It's all done in the programming. So it's all, it's already there. It's very simple. You basically, there's a few factors you can choose or control from the HMI about the amount of time you need to seal, how fast you want to run. Basically all of those calculations are done by the programming. So you really don't have to, uh, you don't have to know all of this as an operator or even as a maintenance mechanic. It's, uh, it's available through the HMI. It's in cho in a few small choices. Right. I really wanted to address uh, someone named Robert had asked in the chat, will it lower that output speed? So I'm it's guessing good. that that's a, a no. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, it, it's, a, it's so sustainable materials do not have to lower the output speed. That's, that's probably the uh, correct, the best answer I could say. And Simon, I'll ask you to comment, but I would say the, uh, uh, there are things like, say, for example, if you're running paper, paper is going to run slow. We're, we're probably have to run slower mainly because it's going to, it has a high propensity to tear. So you cannot run it as fast. But with I, most, of, most of our plastics, as long as the, I've, I've seen most of the ones we run can really run at similar speeds. I don't know, Simon, if you want to add to that. No, I think you summed it up. You're the machine expert here. Um, and as we always say, the machine comes first, then comes the material. <laughs> you create a more high, high output machine and then we have to define and design a new film that seals and keeps up with what the machine is capable of. But I think what you just said uh, sums it up. Um, I, I remember we, uh, we, had a, we had a joint development in Europe with a fast seal technology that enabled the customer to run um, in an excess of, uh, of 250 packs a minute. Um, so yeah, absolutely. 
Awesome. Well, jumping into some big picture questions. Um, this is really for both of you guys. What sorts of products or even industries in general can can offer the biggest chance for material reduction? So, you know, down gauging, even full, like just turning things on their head and going from rigid to, to flexible, different things like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start the, uh, the, I, I think you touched on the, one of the biggest opportunities, probably the biggest opportunity to get uh, material reduction is to go from rigid to plastic or rigid to uh, flexible. That's really, uh, we see that a lot in liquid. So liquid packaging, for example, is, is one that's, there's a, there's a lot of focus in trying to get out of cans. We see in the graphic here, and pallets and pallets of uh, cans. And you can imagine uh, a single roll of film is, can be, you know, it's, it's thousands of impressions typically, you know, 5,000 could be you know, 7,000 impressions, depending on the length of your uh, uh, package. So that e equals five to 7,000 cans on pallets. You get those truckloads of pallets are represented by a, a single roll of film. So you can, logistically, it's, it's um, even aside from the storage space or the, the amount of material that's used, you can really, um, uh, imagine how that impacts your uh, whole supply chain. And Simon, you might, I think you can add a little to that. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, take, take cans or jars um, or carton boxes as an example. They need to be, they need to be pre-manufactured or pre-made cups or trays. Um, it is not only space in a truck that needs to go from a converter or a manufacturer to the actual packing, packing facility. And from there, then center and so on but we're also talking about the weight um, if we're talking about glass jars for instance um, uh, the amount of packaging material that is put on the road every day to go from the manufacturing site to a warehouse or directly to the packing facility and then on to uh, within the uh, the distribution channel um, it's just crazy I can give you an example of a well-known uh, liquor brand uh, that uses a very um, heavy, almost over-engineered green glass bottle. It's a German herbal liquor uh, that, that some of you might be familiar with. Um, if you fill up a truck of, uh, of, uh, of this liquor um, and transport it from point A to B, 70% of the weight that this truck is carrying is glass and only 30% is, uh, is actually the, the, the product content. And I know we're getting to that in a second, but I think next to the uh, in, in the liquid space, absolutely, there is the, 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 the most disruption that we're also seeing on the shelves right now. I mean, it's exciting times when you, when you go yourself into the supermarket. We, we used to buy our cream chase or our guacamole in a, in a cup or something like that. And suddenly it pops up in a, in a pouch with a, with, a, with, a, with a fitment on it that I can easily just squeeze out the product. I don't have to use a spoon or a knife. I can easily actually, it offers so many other purposes as well. Next to the sustainability aspect, it also offers convenience and disruption on the shelf. So um, I think we're getting back later to sharing mutual objectives and goals. So there is, there is a lot of different purposes that you're serving by going into flexible packaging, not only the sustainability aspect, which by far outrules uh, um, all the, the subsequent ones, right? Well, and it's nice when it takes up less room in my recycle bin. <laughs> that is true. So Simon, you sent me this graphic from, I think it's the sustainability report on your website as well. And can you walk us through how to interpret this? Yeah, so we have a whole section on our website, which is really exciting. It's a lot of educational material for everybody to, to kind of dive deeper into, into, into those segments. And obviously, and anybody here at, at Sudpack would be happy to, to dive deeper into that and, and offer uh, um, uh, detailed information on that uh, as a follow-up. But uh, basically what this did, and it's kind of like a detailed overview of what, what Kelly was alluding to already, um, what is truly in a sustainable way when we're talking at the different material or packaging types that there are out there, uh, what is really a sustainable way of packing product? And uh, this was done by our um, corporate marketing group to, to compare one kilogram, which equals about two pounds of, of, uh, 
of in, in imperial units of packaging material across different categories or packaging types, how much product content could you actually protect at the end of the day? And uh, if we follow that logic and we go from left to right, if you take one kilogram, which again is about two pounds of packaging material, and in this case, it's just glass for a jar, you could only end up with about 3.8 pounds of um, soup that you can actually package in this jar. Or if you can it, it's about 16 pounds. So two pounds of packaging material, you can pack 16 pounds of, uh, of soup if you put it in a can. Um, I spare you the carton. I think you, you all get the logic there. But what is really significant, I think, is the, the ratio when we're looking at one kilogram or two pounds of flexible packaging material, if you put that on a Rovima um, liquid pack machine and you, you, you end up with a, with a soup that is packed um, in, in a flexible format, you end up with over a hundred pounds, that's a factor 50, a hundred pounds of product that you can pack. Um, compare that to the amount of soup that you buy for yourself and you put it in your fridge, usually you buy one or two. Now your whole fridge just suddenly is full with the same amount of packaging material and how much soup you can actually pack with it, right? So I think that that really sums it up really well um, that this is by far, not only from a weight, but also from a material usage standpoint, the most sustainable option to pack product today and also in the future. Well, and even for dry goods, I know that that carton, the carton looks like a really good option too. Um, but what a lot of folks don't take into account is for products to be fed into the carton, it doesn't settle right away. So even yep. if, you know, these trucks with, with jars and cans of soup, they're, they're probably getting weighed out. So you're not as much worried about like void space and paying to practically ship air. But if you start talking about dry goods in cartons, then we're per particularly in the pasta industry, we're seeing a lot of disruption there in, in getting, you know, two or three more stacks on a pallet by switching mm -hmm. to flexible packaging, which that is tremendous savings in a segment that there's not a whole lot there's not as much margin, I would say. Mm -hmm. So okay. Kelly, for packaging machinery, jumping back into machinery, what technologies can allow for even further reductions, you know, th that incremental savings that we can see? Yeah, there's a few things that can be considered uh, just to, uh, so just to reduce the amount of materials we're using. So, yeah, for example, we're looking at the graphic here uh, of our or a two finger rule for uh, space needed above the product in order to make a seal when we're making a bag. Um, if your current equipment uh, uh, needs more than that, or if, you're, if you have more than that, you say you've got double that, you, know, you could easily take an inch out of every bag and say, I've, I've got uh, the, uh, I'm going to save some material on, on every pouch. Uh, one of the ways we can do that uh, with certain products doesn't. Uh, work with every product, but uh, the Rubima equipment has the option for uh, a stripping function, which is basically when the jaws come together, though, before they close completely, you can program uh, in a downward movement so that the jaws actually compress the product on the back before we make the seal. Uh, so then we can uh, kind of create that space if the product doesn't settle fast enough on the machine. That's one, that's, so that's a technology that can help with that. There's other ways to look at it. As we look at the seal, um, it's not uncommon for a, a wider seal to be required. If you don't have a strong enough seal, maybe you go for a, a 20 millimeter wide seal instead of what our standard is a 14 millimeter wide seal. Uh, if you can reduce every top and bottom seal by five millimeters, then you can save 10 millimeters uh, per package over the course of a year. That's gonna add up to a lot of film save. Uh, so that's just film you're not using for every bag. Um, so th those are a couple of uh, uh, small uh, technology uh, ways, uh, means to address the, you know, that question. Well, and ever since I had to start kind of thinking like this over the last year or so, you know, just walking around in the gas station, I see so many products sitting in retail ready packages that have the punched holes for merchandising on pegboards. And, you know, that extra film that folks are using 
really could translate into significant year over year savings if their if their market research showed that it's unnecessary. Um, and here's actually some retail ready packaging in this graphic as well. Um, really on that topic of market research, you know, so much of innovation is driven by customer preferences and expectations. Um, and really to both of you guys, what do you see driving trends here? I, I think what we see is, um, I mean, this topic by itself, you could spend, you could spend probably hours on what are, what are the, 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 the smaller trends or tendencies that we see right now in the market or overall in the industry. I think what we, what we really see that um, sustainability and the, the quest for, for, new, for new ways to package product, both material side ways and, and also from an equipment standpoint is, uh, is going to, to keep this industry and all of us um, busy. Um, sustainability definitely is a mega trend, uh, nothing that will go away um, anytime soon. It is here to stay, it will just get bigger as resources get more scarce and pressure from consumers is getting more. Um, we all got to remember there is, uh, um, even here in North America, um, over, the, over the next five years, the, the percentage of millennials that are actually going to join the workforce are, are already in the, in, in the workforce and uh, looking at their incomes and what actually, um, yeah, uh, what what values they have and how much focus they actually have on creating a better tomorrow by using more sustainable packaging solutions, uh, by creating less waste, by uh, re reducing their overall uh, carbon footprint for, for generations to come. So I think, again, this is a mega trend that we're seeing um, that is not going to go away. We are still in an expl exploratory phase how this is actually going to look like. Uh, what materials, how will machines in the future look like? We're making great developments across the board in this industry right now. It's so exciting to be part of this. Um, the developments that we have seen over the last 24 months is just um, breathtaking, to be honest with you, um, how much we, we have seen on, on both sides um, happening. Um, that it's not so much about where we are at today, but the trend is really we have this common topic, this common goal to, to, uh, to, to create a better future, a more sustainable future, um, given equipment and materials. And this is the overall trend that we see actually. Well, in doing research on the topic, I did read that 250 of the largest companies in the world, of those companies, 93% are now reporting on their sustainability efforts because they recognize that Millennials are reaching their prime spending years. So, and that's really important to them. So that's, that's really cool. So Ab absolutely. And uh, just, just adding to that, we have, we have, uh, we have, we have surveys uh, over the last two years, three years ago, um, over 90% of all CEOs of fortune 500 companies have said, this is going to decide which fortune 500 company is actually going to be here in the next decade and beyond. Because, like I said, it, it is a trend to stay. Sustainability is going to stay. And it's going to be a, a challenge for, for, for all of us participating in this industry. So let's, let's start talking about solutions and game plan and strategy. Um, so how can marketing and engineering teams work collaboratively to pilot new materials? How can they, you know, confidently belly up to the boardroom table and start trying to figure out what the best solution is for their products. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, uh, the important, uh, probably the most important thing I can recommend uh, if you take, uh, to take away from this discussion is say, uh, if you're in the process of trying to develop a new package for your product, and uh, I would get your machinery and material supplier involved as early as possible. And those conversations uh, happen a lot. A lot of times we're not involved. Uh, if we can be involved, we can give you feedback on that might be very important to us. Uh, some small detail about, uh, about a choice about a package or package design or the material selection. 
that can really impact how well it's going to run in, in your operations. And maybe those things, small things don't mean anything to you or your marketing team, uh, but they are really important to the machinery or the material perspective. If we can have that opportunity to have early input, uh, that's really um, probably the most important thing we can do because it's really hard to, those decisions are already made when it comes to us. It's very challenging to, uh, to deal with. Simon? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, yeah, and Emily, I think the answer is in your question. Um, teams working together as teams, um, because at the end of the day, it's it's so much about that that overall common or mutual goal and actually connecting all the different stakeholders in such a project whenever it comes to replacing a certain pack style or a material or even developing a new product or a new uh new item um, to, to, to Kelly's point, uh, involve the equipment maker from the get-go, involve the material maker from the get-go. Usually there is so much um, uh, experience and know-how from both sides at the table that can be shared very early in the process that can also help to save some time down the road uh, that, uh, and resources that are used internally. Um, and I think Getting back to that shared and mutual objective, it is so important that from the get-go, um, those are shared and you and you and you agree on on certain on certain basics there because we we all know that uh, the participants who are in marketing, for instance, today or in, in 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 product management, they have much different goals or objectives when launching a new product or repurposing a new product. It's more about the claim out there. To, uh, to put a recyclable or a sustainable stamp on that product to actually obtain more sales to generate more revenue. Whereas uh, folks in, in R&D and engineering want to make sure that it, that it perfectly runs and as smoothly as, perf uh, as, as, as possible. And our, our operations and engineer, uh, engineering colleagues on the call uh, just do not want to have any disruption in, in getting product uh, produced and uh, and shipped out the door with as, as little complications or leakers uh, down the road. And um, those are extremely challenging um, targets to all get them on agreeing on the same, on the same purpose or on the same goal. So again, getting, getting all participants of those projects on a round table, agreeing on, on basics because this is such a big topic. Sustainability by itself, like, like we said on the previous slide, is such a big topic that will decide on so much for not only us, but for generations to come. So um, it is important that we start somewhere and somewhere sometimes is not the end goal, but a step in between. Um, so uh, uh, it's a step-by-step it's a -step approach that we have to take with common mutual agreed uh, objectives that we then also work together as one team, equipment manufacturer, with material vendor, with the customer, and the uh, the subsequent uh, team members and stakeholders on the customer side. That's a huge point. And really recognizing that everyone is going to define the success of this packaging solution differently. Um, that's huge. And, you know, supporting customers through these you know, hard dates that retailers are setting to yeah. getting those priorities out on the table is key because, you know, they're all valid and they're, they're coming at us like a freight train. Um, Kelly, you talked about making sure that your machine vendor is involved on the front end. Um, how can they help companies navigate these changes? Sure. The, and it really comes down to the feedback of uh, what, what, uh, pieces are important to the machine. We can really offer you a lot of insight into that. Uh, I, I know that uh, Rovima does in our R&D, in our research and development group, we do probably 100 to 200 uh, film evaluations every year. So we're testing films on our equipment. New films, uh, these might be films that come to us through a customer or as, through a development with uh, with the material supplier that uh, we, just, we want to evaluate those. How do they run? What feedback can we offer? Uh, what changes might be made? Sometimes we can, if it's, if it's in the development stage, we might be able to give that feedback and say, these are the important things you could change. Uh, or the, in your package design, what could you do to your package design 
it would make it more uh, more simple to run for your operations. It's really that from the perspective of the machine, obviously we're trying to make a good package that's uh, uh, we, that's the key for us to make a good package that is meets your goals, but also uh, that are not just the consumer goals, but your operations goals. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I'm sure a secondary benefit to all the testing and getting those materials spec'd out, that's only going to get folks to market that much more efficiently from like a project management perspective. Um, Simon, to pose a similar, well, really the same question to you, what's a packaging material vendor's role in helping companies navigate changes? Yeah, um, I think our role is changing. Um, in this ever so changing environment, our role is changing dramatically. Um, whereas with uh, standard materials uh, or traditional um, material combinations that we have seen in the industry for, for quite some time where, where Kelly knows exactly by application and by, by, by product weight or pack style, what the temperatures would be on the machine and what the throughput would be. Um, with those challenging, challenging uh, topics that we have ahead of us, um, with um, with uh, challenges from the consumer, eventually challenging the retailer, retailer changing, uh, challenging our our customers, and then uh, then actually challenging us on providing more sustainable or even recyclable uh, alternatives or solutions in the future. Um, there is so many exciting developments, not only by Südpark, by, but by the whole industry out there. And just knowing, talking about the four quadrants that I just outlined before from, from uh, down gauging to uh, at Südpark using renewable resources or even offering fully recyclable products or even going a step further to a truly circular economy uh, solution with chemicals, uh, chemical uh, recycling, um, you can get lost. And uh, I think next to providing those materials, those options uh, for, for us as a, as a partner, as a true partner, as we want to be seen in this industry to our customers, um, it is also our, our task and in my opinion, also my duty to educate, but mostly to navigate and help our customers based on their challenges, based on their objectives, based on what they want to achieve with their products, with their applications, the goals they want to reach. You mentioned before the sustainability objectives that certain companies have set for themselves, which are very aspiring, very good, but very aspiring, very challenging goals to reach in a, in a very short time frame. So you need to stay focused. You need to work as teams. And at the same token, you need the right partners like Rovima, like Südpack to help you navigate through that because we have that experience. We have those applications market ready to get you one step closer to achieving those goals. Well, I'm excited to see what the future holds for all these innovations. Um, that is going to button up kind of the presentation phase and really what we had prepared for today's uh, discussion. So let's go ahead and take some time to dive into some questions before we close. Um, here is one, and this is a, probably what a lot of folks are wondering. Simon, really, this is for you. What is the cost difference of fully recyclable film materials? It depends so much on the product. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's products available and you could see it on my smile be, uh, in my face because this is a question we get so often when we talk about all those exciting solutions that we have right there's products where we are able to be cost neutral because we're able to 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 down gauge and uh, to to replace certain structures with others um in a way that we have never thought about it before because we're just in this exploratory phase like everybody else right um, but there's also others, depending on which route you want to take, where there, there might be a slight upcharge, but then you get, uh, you get better, better barrier properties or you have a, a better story to tell, which then enables you to grow your sales. So it's really difficult to tell it. It, it depends so much on the application, the market you're in, the categories, um, to give you a precise answer on that. Um, for those that would like to have a detailed understanding of how that would look like for them. Um, I'm more than happy, or Suitpack in general is more than happy to, to reconnect and look at your 
product in detail, your application in detail, and, and see what an alternative would look like also from a cost perspective. Um, but it's a bit too much of a loaded question to give you a precise answer. For sure. Well, and you talked about circular economy. Um, Simon, another question is, what chemical recycling options are available in the United States? So um, we have launched products in other parts of the world, mainly in Europe, mainly for the protein industry, but they can be applied to any other industry as well. Um, and they are market ready. We're doing um, already some, some, some trials here, here in the US. Um, so there's market ready solutions that are just waiting to be trialed here also in North America by customers. Cool. Well, we are much over time. Um, <laughs> I do want to thank everyone for all the great questions. Um, if you took the time to submit a question and we have not addressed it yet, look out for a response to your answer in a follow-up email. Um, just as a parting note, sustainability really is such a, a broad issue. And no matter where you stand on the topic, there are a lot of benefits to really educating ourselves around all of the considerations and exploring how we can be better stewards of our resources in our own personal lives and in the business decisions that we make every day. Um, I want to thank Kelly and Simon for joining me today and giving us some great insights from really your drastically different perspectives in the packaging industry. Um, and then I do want to personally thank all of our attendees for listening in today. I hope you all enjoyed it and we will see you on the next one. Bye everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks y'all.